Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sue and welcome to the Masterclass. This evening we are joining the short answer and the Masterclass together and so we're allowing our entire community to participate in the Masterclass. We've done that once before and we had tremendous response to it and uh, many, many thanks. So we're going to allow that to happen again. So. Hopefully, this will allow you to get a taste of what happens in the master class and, uh, and get a feel for being able to plug into that on a regular basis. We go deep into many different topics, and the whole idea for the master class is to, to allow us to recognize that while we're going down the road and we're doing these things in our lives that uh, stir questions, and we, we feel that we're walking around or you're driving around or living life, and we have this question kind of running in the back of our mind that, that I really want people to understand that that's not a question. It's actually an answer ready to birth itself. It's just coming up and out of you in the form of what feels like a question first because it's not quite stabilized. So what I do is I take a bunch of different questions and we put them together and we write them down over here and then I answer them all together at one time so that we can demonstrate that there is a tapestry that is running through the course of your life and that tapestry is one answer weaving into another, weaving into another, weaving into another. And so that all the different topics of our lives actually come together in one conversation. So with any luck at all, this rowdy crowd that I'm sitting with right now, uh, we're going to have some questions that we can work with. So I'm sitting here at a, an advanced coursework um, uh, here in Indianapolis in uh, my home where uh, uh, we've filled the room with people in round two of level three this year, and it is, um, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty, I'm scared, actually. I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> See? See? See what I have to deal with? So uh, some of these people have been here many times. Those are the rowdy ones that you can hear. Some of them are here for the first time, and they are so nice. <laughs> They're being so nice. It's amazing. It's such a delight to have you here. So... In the coursework, we are very interested in awakening and having a darn good time doing it. So the awakening that is occurring is we're recognizing that we are not uh, having to be governed by the personality, that we can actually allow that deep soulful self to reveal, to just come out, to roll out, to have its way in the world, uh, and to have a life, to have a voice, to have engagement, to have relationship, to be expressing itself fully. It is what you might recognize as the small, still voice in the background. Uh, it is the essential self. In fact, we made a joke the last time that, that uh, the, the last weekend when we had a level three here, that if you're looking for the essential self, if you're looking for your true self, you might check under the bus because you've probably thrown it under the bus many times in the course of your life. So if you're looking for your true self, check the trash. Check under the bus because uh, chances are we override it, we ignore it, we deny it until it actually stops trying to make, uh, make a go of it. And that is when we become uh, depleted. It's when we become lethargic, apathetic. It's when we become sick. It's when we become uninspired. It's when we, we start to choose alternative ways of living that just don't serve our eternity. Meaning you're an eternal being. You're made to be living on, riding on, and running an immense amount of energy through your system constantly, an endless supply of it. It's supposed to be coming through your body, rejuvenating, refreshing, animating you, and then uh, going into the earth and coming out into the environment and dropping in and replenishing itself constantly and continuously. So if that's not happening, we are here this evening to help you tap into ways to begin to allow that to happen. Now the master class isn't the coursework, but I of course have to infuse pieces and parts of the coursework into the conversation of the master class in order to make sense out of the things that we're talking about. But it is not to replace the coursework because there are so many details in, in learning all of the techniques, the principles and the practices that that requires a lot more than just one hour every month. But it is my delight to bring this information to you in whatever way that we can while you're all over the world sitting at home. So we have people tuning in from Norway, we have people tuning in from Australia, we have people turning in, tuning in from all across Europe, uh, we have some people in Abu Dhabi that, that are plugging in, and uh, I just love to say that name, Abu Dhabi. Say it with me, Abu, Abu Dhabi. Dhabi. It's just fun. <laughs> it's just fun to do. All right, so we, we get to play together. 
And this is serious stuff. And um, there actually is a very clear, real, crisp science behind what we're doing. And, uh, and, and that's what makes it fun. Because science and, uh, and, common, and common sense and spirituality and, uh, and what your basic gut feelings and your deep wisdom have always known are finally coming together. They are on trajectories that are intersecting. And we get to be alive at a time when all of that gets to be true. So chances are, if you have thought it and felt it somewhere deep inside of you, it is the truth. And it's my job to help bring that to the surface of your life and allow it to be part of what makes your decisions. Part of the timing, part of the sequencing of how you choose to do what you do when you do it. All of it is a rhythm. All of it is a tapestry. It is truly a magic carpet that is uh, rolling out in front of you. And, uh, and it is our delight to come together and celebrate that. So let's get started. All right. So how we do that is uh, you guys have to come up with some questions because I got a blank sheet here. So if anybody has anything that you'd like to make sure that we delve into a little bit this evening, we'll pop it up here. So you do, madam. Yes. Yep. What do you got? So how do you know if you're in the void? And then how is how long is too long to be in the void? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is the void? How do you know if you're in it? And how long is it okay to be in it? Okay. So uh, we will return um, there. I'm going to put a little clock there so that I know <laughs> that we're talking time on this as well. Okay. So what else we got? Yes. Kind of building on that. Um, between expansion and contraction, uh, I've had a couple of big expansions recently, and then that kabam of the contraction. And looking, and I recognize it as that at this point, but looking for a way to just um, be a little more gentle with myself. One, like just a um, key word or something that could bring me into realization. Uh, when in the midst of a contraction? Yeah. Okay. So uh, expansion and contraction. So uh, huh, let's see here. Uh, you're probably not going to know what this is. Uh -huh. What is it? It's a jellyfish. Very good. Okay. So it is uh, also in another state periodically. Okay. So that's the contracted state. And the, okay, see, this, this is how my mind works. Okay, what else do we have? I work much better with pictures. Yes. Um, <laughs> how does hypnotherapy relate to or complement the energy codes? Hypnotherapy, um, as well as uh, how does it relate to or interrelate with yes. or enhance? Or, I use hypnotherapy with my clients, uh -huh. and I get uh -huh. them into a state where they find their own wisdom, their own inner wisdom. Uh -huh. So I'm just wondering how that kind of fits in with what you're talking about with the energy codes. Okay. So if we have conscious and subconscious, so I'm, I know we're not putting them to sleep, but I'm going to just do this <laughs> because it's going to allow me to see what's going on here. Okay. So what else do we have? Yes. Um, I was wondering what uh, what an energy codes approach would be to menopause and um, how to sail through it gracefully. <laughs> okay, how am I sa menopause? What on earth do I draw? Because <laughs> what I'm seeing right now isn't really what I should put up there. So I'm going to write menopause. <laughs> okay, I'm seeing fallopian tubes and all kinds of stuff. So. We'll just go with some basic <laughs> fundamentals here. Save me, yes. Uh, how to understand better the human timeline, oneness, and everything is happening now. The human timeline and oneness. Oneness, okay. And everything happening now or in the present moment. <laughs> Collapsing time, right? This is where we're going to talk about, right there. Got that? Yes. I've been here many times and am so grateful for all of the awakening and what I've seen, what I've learned about a deeper truth that I never knew about before. Yes. And what I would like to know is how to better walk this planet and help plant the seed in others mm. to um, be interested in asking some questions. So that how do we can get here too, without me telling them you need to do this, you know, just a seed. Yeah. Something for them to think about. 
Johnny Appleseed, right? Is that that's right? So like, how do we plant the seed? Uh, okay, so there's this is a seed, okay, and uh, you know, how do we uh, plant that seed so that it is uh, going to flourish into something that people can uh, can relate to in their own time? Okay, got that. Yes. A person who was here last week posted on Facebook that you said. Talk, think less, love more. Love more, yeah. Think less, love more. Yeah. I'd love to hear you talk about that. Okay, think less, love more. Just say more about that. There's not anything, I just get to say anything I want about that? Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> okay, so we have another one of these and one of these. Okay, so we're going to do that from that. Okay, that'll remind me to talk about that. You got that? All right, yeah. Um, tomorrow is the fall equinox. How do physical, natural phenomena affect our ability to access prana? Maybe you have some insight into that? Sweet. Okay. <laughs> so, how do, um, like, planetary uh, realities or, um, or orbits or alignments, yes, affect... Um, uh, what? Affect what? Talk to me. Affect our ability to access prana, affect our ability to kind of feel all parts of this or be in the presence even more. Sweet. Even in how? Yeah. How's my solar system? <laughs> yeah. Pretty good. And then gotta have a moon there. Oh, that was the moon. We have two moons. It's, <laughs> it's a new, okay, here's Mercury out here because of the equinox, okay? So Mer- Mercury and retrograde and all of that. Uh, is happening. So, okay, we're good. I think my page is about as full as my mind can be right now. All right, so this is good to roll. All right, so this is the first time I've ever had overlapping pictures. I don't know what that means about you people, but <laughs> here we go. So, so what we want to, to recognize is that none of this information can be forced on anyone, that all of this information is in everyone, and it is here to birth itself, to, to root itself, and to grow and to reveal in its own right time. One of my teachers was Angelus Arian, a cultural anthropologist that lived in the Bay Area for many years, and she just recently passed in the last few years, and she was a tremendous, um, a tremendous cultural individual. She traveled the world studying indigenous cultures and how they lived and worked together. And she used to tell a story about when she was a child. She grew up in, in Basque and she was a child. Uh, her father was, a, was a, an avid gardener and he was planting bulbs in the earth and he was teaching her about planting. And so he put this, this bulb in the earth and covered it up and they watered it. And, and she was all about learning how to you know, water things and have them grow. And so every day she would come up above the place where they planted the bulb and she would say, Borache, Borache. And she would go home, go back inside, go to, you know, live the day, go to bed, get up the next morning, come over, and look at it, and there's nothing there. And she'd be like, Borache, Borache. And so nothing would happen. She'd go and live her life and go to bed and get up the next morning day after day. So Borache meant bloom, bloom, bloom. There was nothing happening. So she was totally upset about the fact that nothing was happening. And her father came over. She was crying. It's not working. It's, the bulb is dead. It's not going to do anything. So he digs up the bulb and he pulls it out of the ground and he shows her that this taproot has been busy going down before anything would come up and break the surface of the soil and grow. So, you know, she got in her mind that ultimately we have to cultivate uh, in unseen ways before we ever get to see the blooming of anything. And so when we're talking about planting seeds, uh, the way to know what to say, when to say, what to water, when to water, is to, to do so with consistency. You have to water the bulb regularly, right? So how do we know when to say something in order to inspire someone to bodice, to bloom, right? So the idea is this. There is an impulse in you, the evolutionary impulse to grow and to share. Because we are one, there is an inherent desire in each of us to share. 
because as we are expanding, the way that we experience that expansion is by sharing and exchanging and by sharing our experience of growing and expanding. So you'll have an impulse to say something. What you have to say is something that's relevant to the person that you're talking to. And you have to do so unconditionally because their taproot is digging in long before you will ever see or sense or hear them come up through the soil and, and bodice and bloom. So our unconditionality serves our ability to know when and what to say with any kind of consistency. So consistency is constantly pouring out of me. I'm constantly, I mean in this setting, I get to just roll with it all the time. But in life, I just will drop something here, drop something there. I don't even look back to see if they're uh, catching it, if they're noticing, etc. In fact, the less I look back, the sooner they tend to pick it up and do something with it. Particularly if they can then feel like it was their idea. So if you really want to use your creative essence, which we all do because it's what we're made of, if you want to use it in a way that's going to serve the most, the fastest, uh, do it completely unconditionally and use your creative essence to find ways that you sense the person is going to relate to. And imbued in it, embedded in it, is what you know is a nurturing presence that will allow for the blooming to occur in its right time. So, so maybe you're speaking an entirely different language, but if you're just even focused on this body of work when you say what you say, the vibrational frequency is in it, and it's getting watered. It's getting watered. It's getting watered. And it allows you to have a stress-free, unconditional relationship with people who aren't really necessarily interested in engaging in the actual conversation with the words we get to use when we're in this coursework. So you get to use your creative energy to find other words that mean the same thing. Find analogies, find ways that what they're doing and what they're into is really a symbolic version of what it is that we would be talking about if we were talking about it directly here. I'm constantly doing that. Ask them questions, get to know what's going on in their world, and you will see that there's only one thing going on here, and we're all in the same experience. They're just different flavors, different colors, different versions of it. So when we start to look like that, we start to see that there is constantly a, a, a collapsing of a differential between worlds, that, that there is always, always, always a cycle taking place in everyone's life. Always, always, always the invitation is to think less about it and love more. In fact, exactly what we're talking about of how to bloom and how to, who, to encourage and plant seeds for people, the, the more we think less and love more, if I'm focused on loving them, I'm going to ask questions about them and I'm going to feel where they are and the words are going to come from a different place in me. When I'm in my heart space, different words occur to me to say. When I'm in my own enlovement, I just made up a word, okay? <laughs> when I'm in my own enlovement, uh, what happens is I, I care, I sense, I feel you, I know what matters to you, I can tell. And so I automatically am translating the words that I would say into a language that you can feel, that you can feel. So I'm talking my heart to their heart, and my head is saying the words, but it's really translating my love place, my space of love, that vibrational frequency of love. When we're coming from love, people can hear us. So the statement was that I said, think less, love more, and that is that that the heart is tapped into the abundance of all that is. And if we can anchor the mind down into the heart space, not think about the heart, but come in an elevator shaft and come down to the heart space and feel ourselves sitting in there and just, just remain, just live there, just dwell in that space, what happens is we, we start to drop even deeper and when we drop even deeper than love, we tether the love to the deep wisdom and we bring it all the way to the third dimension when we root it, when we get all the way down in here. The love that is able to come up and out of us is a vibrational frequency that everyone can relate to. So when we're trying to think of how to do things and we're trying to think of ways to say things or even think about what to say, if you will mulabanda and squeeze your heart and breathe down into the belly, literally the vibrational frequency of your system changes. And when the vibrational frequency of your system changes, different thoughts occur to you. 
different bandwidth is running through your system. You pick and choose things from infinite possibility that resonate at the heart level instead of picking and choosing things out of the infinite stream of information that's passing through you constantly that are at the thinking level. And so our minds operate at different frequencies from each other's. Our hearts all tap in to the same. So we want to unify with someone. We have to be seated in the heart space and allow that unifying principle that emits from the heart space to be what brings us together. So if we go head to head, we are differences to differences. If we go heart to head, we're sameness to differences. If we go heart to heart, we're sameness to sameness. And unity happens there. When unity happens, we operate in oneness. And when we're operating in oneness, we are in timelessness. We are eternal. We are youthing. We are getting younger. We're becoming more vital. And so this timeline of the life experience becomes uh, up on ended. It becomes upended onto itself and it becomes a vertical life that we're living instead of a horizontal life that we're living. And when we're in this verticality, time stands still and everything is now. We collapse time and we're operating right here in the now when we step into life from a place of love. In order to be wholly and fully in a place of love, we have to learn how to slow this mind down because the heart frequency in the now is at a different vibrational frequency than the thinking mind is operating in. The two have to line up to each other in order to get this system to do exactly this and to collapse upon itself. So when we're talking about oneness and we're talking about unity and we're trying to find ways to unify between, uh, between couples, between uh, two aspects of a couple, between family members, between community members, between uh, national members, between countries uh, around the globe, when we're looking for the unifying principle, we have to go to love. We can't march against anything. We can't stand in anger. We have to stand in love. It might be fierce love, but we have to stand in love. And when we do, what happens is that sameness in all of us starts to build. And when it's present in enough of us, this whole thing about operating from the linear mind just starts to disappear into this constant loving presence. When the loving presence is what motivates and inspires your words, then what comes out of you is the vibrational frequency that allows others to be guided right into that and to drop into that space with you. You can only draw people into love. You can't push them into love. Okay? You can only draw them into love. And so what we have to do, and you do in an amazing way, the one who asked this very question, um, is we have to reside in love. We have to come from love when we speak. We have to uh, be inspired by love when we come up with projects to do. It has to be unconditional, unattached, and completely abundant if we truly want the vibration to be felt and to be known. When we do that, what happens is we automatically start evolving rapidly. When we're evolving rapidly, we're, we start moving energy through our lives, not only through this body, but through our lives. And that energy movement through our lives takes us through a cycle. It takes us through a cycle of creating things and then sustaining them and nurturing the things that we have created. And then those creative projects, they serve their purpose. And once they've served their purpose, then it's time to let go. It's time for them to no longer be held on to. It's complete, it is done, and as that completes itself in the cycle of life, the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to slip into a void temporarily <laughs> that might seem like forever uh, when we're in it, but we're going to slip into a void, and that void is actually when expansion is occurring so that the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to create something new 
And then after the creation of that new project, we will develop ways to sustain that new project. It will serve the purpose that it is destined to serve. And as it is serving that purpose, it rounds the corner into completion and then it deconstructs and it starts to dissolve. And we have to be equally willing to let go as we were to be enthusiastic about the creation of a new project. That cycle is a beautiful cycle. The thing that's in between the letting go and the beginning of something new is what I reference as a void. The whole of creation is always expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting. It's expanding and it's anchoring, and then it's expanding and it's anchoring. And that is a pulsation that is occurring constantly and continuously throughout uh, all of time, beyond time. So in that, when we bring that process into a linear uh, explanation here in the third dimension, it's a cycle of life that's happening, okay? In the void between the creation, the sustaining, and the deconstructing, this space right here is one of, I have no idea. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing right now. People ask me what I do. I say, I'm in between things, right? <laughs> Right? Have we said that before? I'm in between things right now. Oh, really? How long have you been in between things? A while, okay? Because there's, un- there's discomfort, but it's a cultural discomfort. It's actually quite natural. So what we're doing in the Energy Codes coursework is learning how to manage the void, to master the void, to cultivate the void, to get the most out of the void, to bring comfort into the void, because when we do all those things, we become present in the void. When we're fully present, accepting unconditionally, undeniably, uh, wholly in the void, we receive immense information. That information comes in, it lands, it comes up through us, and we can read it and feel it and sense it, and a new project is birthed out of us. The problem with our society, our culture, is that it's not aware of this. And it's so not aware of this that it puts us in a void-denying culture, all right? Mm-hmm. It puts us in a void-denying life in that there's a judgment about it. Like we're not supposed to be in the void. We're supposed to be busy. We're supposed to be productive. We're supposed to be doing these things. We're supposed to be accomplishing something. And I'm particularly thrilled when people claim some space and some time for themselves that allows them to truly sit in this void space because it is rare, it takes courage, and it only takes courage until we actually do it. Once we do it, we know it just takes permission because it's so beautiful to actually allow yourself to stay there, to sit there, to be there. And after we've done that enough times, it actually becomes fortifying and nurturing because we're cultivating more of who we are. So think of it this way. When I expand, more of me drops in. More of the unknown parts of me are now available to my awareness. If I knew all of those parts, I wouldn't be growing, right? But if I'm growing and I'm expanding, there are going to be more parts of me that I have access to that don't have a face and they don't have a name. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know that part of me. So inside of it, it feels like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, etc. So how long is okay to be in the void? Yes. That's my answer. How long is okay? Uh Uh-huh. That's how long. How long I'm there is how long I'm supposed to be there. And however long I'm there, if it tests my patience, if it challenges me, if it freaks me out, if it scares me, then I know that's when the work is being done. So if I can fully accept the discomfort, if I can be present with the discomfort, then the work will be done. I have to become comfortable with the discomfort in the void. Then, done, and it springs up a new connection. I finally connected my mind with what is. When my mind will connect and have a better relationship with what is, the whole world changes. Everything changes. Beyond this world changes. The whole of your being changes. When we establish the most important relationship in our entire lives, which is our relationship between the mind and the way things go. The relationship, another way to say it, the relationship between the mind and what is. When those two start embracing, 
this thing not only kicks into a new level of creation, it comes around the cycle and the very next time you exit the void, you exit a floor up and you come around again and then you exit and elevate and you're now operating on an even higher level of consciousness. So that process is spiral dynamics. That's it. It's the spiraling of the life experience. Riding right through the middle of that is the overriding evolutionary principle. And that is that we are destined to expand, destined to grow, therefore destined to be in the moment of not knowing something about ourselves. That's when we usually go out and get another degree, go out and get a new marriage, move because this town doesn't serve me anymore, something along those lines. Sound familiar? Okay? It's one of those. We don't need to do that. All we need to do is become completely comfortable with the discomfort. And then what happens is the magnifying um, uh, aspect of the mind drops on to this deep wisdom that is yet to be named, and we experience it as a void. And when that happens, it picks up momentum and drives all the way up to the consciousness. And the next thing you know, we have a new idea. The next thing you know, we feel really inspired and totally plugged in again. What's getting plugged in is the mind is getting plugged into this deep truth that is running through me. So I'm interested in us doing that consciously and intentionally. So one of the questions is about hypnotism and how, do we, how does it relate to what we're doing? I'm particularly interested in people learning how to do this consciously, but I also know there are many, many ways to access the subconscious, some of which are in some of the techniques that we use through best technique, through best release, through meditation, through the breath work. All of those things are actually accessing the subconscious and bringing consciousness to it, okay? We're coming underneath this line of consciousness, accessing the subconscious and bringing it up through this gateway so that we can sense and feel and know ourselves in a new way. Hypnotism takes the conscious mind out of the picture long enough for something to rise up so that we get another sense of it. And so then when we come out of hypnotism and we can work with what was revealed under hypnosis, we have the opportunity to take that and cultivate and integrate it and bring it into the body. I still would highly recommend that an individual that is undergoing hypnosis also does the breath work, the embodiment work that we're using in these principles because there is no revelation, there is no aha that we come to no matter what the technique to get to the aha is that will stay with us in a sustainable manner if we don't embody it. Mm -hmm. So we have to build the embodiment circuits to be able to walk that into life so that it's available to us when it's time to make a decision or give a response in a relationship or in a communication or in a decision at work or whatever it is that we're striving to accomplish, right? So hypnotism plays a great role, just like meditation plays a great role, just like best release plays a great role, and a best technique plays a great role, and, and Reiki work plays a great role, massage plays a great role. Everything in differing ways play fantastic roles in keeping this doorway open so that the information, which is actually here, billions of impulses are bombarding your energy field every millisecond. Only a few of them land in your conscious mind. The rest of them land in your gut, in your core presence. And that information rises up here to your conscious awareness or not, and we want it to. So hypnosis is another way to get it to rise up. Too much interference on the line shuts this door, so it requires things that will get us underneath the story to this information. Once it's brought up to awareness, no matter the method, then we have to do embodiment exercises to get it to land, stick, stay, and come to life in the course of our lives. Right? There are, there are many moments with these revelations where we expand and then we have to embody. And then we expand and then we have to embody. And we expand and then we have to anchor. You know, we've been talking about that uh, from a few different angles already in our conversation. And, and one of the things that I want to point out is that when we come into that embodiment piece, that contraction piece, when we come into that quickening or anchoring moment, it can be painful. It can be, uh, we can feel disillusioned. It can feel harsh. It can feel uh, like a lot of friction. It can feel like we're losing ground or it doesn't feel as good as it did when we were in the expansion. So the whole idea is when you are in your expansive state, 
anchor, anchor, anchor. Do the work that you learn in the coursework. Do the work when you're in the elated state. But sometimes people don't remember to do that when they're all up in their happiness, right? We're celebrating, we're dancing, we're, we're doing whatever. And it's not the first thought to take it to the body. We usually, at best, think to take it to the body when we're in, uh, when we're in trauma drama, when we are in some kind of need. And oftentimes we don't even think about it when we're in that kind of a state. We kind of forget it all together. So what we want to do is recognize that the most important thing that I can do with my mind is to take my mind to the body. If I'm being lovingly present with myself, or even if I'm trying to learn how to be lovingly present with myself, to take the attention to the body and just sense and feel and know. One of the ways that I know are the easiest to remember to take your attention to the body is if you have a ritual in your life of doing so, a ritual of the practices. If every day you get up and you do something physical like yoga or the five rites or some kind of body movement that has consciousness associated with it, you're going to get to know your body. The mind is going to get to know the body better. And when the mind and the body become better friends, it starts to cultivate a thickening of this essence inside. And when that essence is cultivated enough, it softens the blow of everything. It's, it's like it, your life becomes more liquidy. So if you were underwater, under liquid, and somebody punched you, it wouldn't have nearly the impact as if you were standing in the air or standing on the ground and through the air the punch was delivered, right? There, it's, everything is slowed down. There's some, something viscous in the space in between the parts. And actually, when we start to cultivate this essence inside of us, it's as if everything slows down and the blow gets softened. The more liquid light is present. So what are some tips to make that happen? The more you are mula banda ing and squeezing the heart and breathing up and down the central channel, the more it's going to cultivate this essence within your core. And so when the compression comes that is there for the purpose of you anchoring what it is that you've awakened to, big openings require big anchorings. Do it consciously or the world is going to take care of it for you. It's going to, it's going to create some kind of cha charge that feels really harsh. So how do we do it? Um, through a regular ritual by feeling your body. When you are creating a ritual of feeling the body, there, is, there are very few times throughout the course of a day that you're not aware of what you're doing with your body, where your body is in space, etc. So you do a physical exercise. Like tomorrow at our coursework, we're going to go out and do yoga. And, to, and, and tomorrow afternoon or the next morning, you're going to feel some things in your body that you weren't feeling the day before because you're moving the body in certain ways that you're, you're not as used to. So we have to put that kind of a ritual into our lives so that we're constantly aware of what's going on and what's developing. There's a project going on inside of my body all of the time that is cultivating new circuitry. I'm constantly working on, on accessing additional uh, mastery inside the body because every time I uplevel that, my consciousness uplevels and I'm able to share more and more and more with you. And it is because I'm constantly bringing the mind into the body with the breath and marrying those three aspects of my wholeness. So ways to remind yourself that you're just in one of those contractive states um, is to constantly be working with the breath work, the breath of loving presence, to put yourself back into a ritual. Maybe you've gotten away from some aspects of a ritual that you can, you can return to. Maybe you can deepen that practice. Maybe you can add something onto it or shift it up a little bit so that there is consciousness in what you're doing if your routine has become rote and you're not quite as conscious about it as you were before. Anything that is loving, anything that slows down the mind, anything that is nurturing, uh, something as simple as committing to getting in a, a pool or a body of water or a bath of salt water uh, every day for seven days in a row. As silly as it seems, it will transform what's happening energetically with your system because of the ritual, because of the commitment of taking the time, and particularly because of the water element. So keep that in mind. Soothing and softening the electricity that happens and that gets ignited during an expansive state uh, or an expansive phase in your life. Nurture it with, with water getting in the ocean, getting in a pool, getting in a salt bath, 
These kinds of things are tremendously beneficial. When my father was going through so many openings and expansions uh, after my mother passed in, on her year anniversary, he was almost crippled because of what he was not allowing himself to process on an emotional level because he didn't want to be one of those people that was still talking about his spouse 10 years later and would cry. So he got busy driving his okayness. And I was very concerned about that because it happened like the day after the funeral. He started talking this way. And all I could think was, ay, 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 at some point this is going to come back around. So on the anniversary, there were so many more emotions and living back through those moments, so much of it was present again. It was undeniable. And he went down. He went down for three weeks, on the, six weeks on the couch, not coming off, just in pain and misery and emotion and not knowing what to do with those energies. The one thing that helped him integrate faster than anything else was to get in a salt bath. So I, was, I just encouraged him because I knew that after that big experience happened in my life and my circuits were fried because I was accessing something I did not have the circuits in place to process. When I awakened as that ray of light, could see 360 degrees around me, etc., the thing that soothed me the most was getting in a salt bath. So perhaps committing to just doing that, maybe just for seven days, three days, seven days, 21 days. Your body runs in three-day cycle, seven-day cycle, 21-day cycle. So if you try it for three days and you don't feel any different, you're going for seven. You try it for seven days, not so much. We're going to see a really squeaky clean person who's taking a <laughs> bubble bath every night for 21 days. It will, it will have an impact for you. So hopefully that will be helpful. These rhythms and these circuits that are happening in cycles, all of this thing that we're talking about are completely true. There is a complete influence happening in every cell of your body. One of the things that I love about the human physiology is that it is the organizing principle of all of creation. What that means is it's a holographic universe. Everything that is happening in the whole of the universe is happening in your own body. And everything that is happening in your own body at large is also happening in every cell, individual cell in your body. It is, it is so fantastic what science is revealing to us about this that currently it is even uh, being, and actually in, in very ancient practices, it is understood that, that there are aspects of every cell in your body that correlate to the very planets of the cosmos. There's a portion of your cell that correlates to Mercury. There's a portion of your cell that correlates to Saturn. There's a portion of your cell that correlates to the sun. Likewise, in the body, there's a portion of the brain that correlates to the sun. A sun salutation in yoga is actually directing the energy toward the thalamus in the center of the brain. The right and left side of that is enhanced when we do a moon salutation as well. When Mercury is in retrograde and everybody says, oh, don't do that now because Mercury is in retrograde, it will surely blow up in, in your face. So they wait for Mercury to come out of retrograde to step into things. Uh, there's actually something real about that. However, uh, we want to, to have the both and happening. We want to be in, and I'll tell you a story about this. Uh, I'm, I'm getting ready to, to take a, a book to publishers. Um, a book proposal to publishers. And a dear friend of mine was very excited about the fact that this was happening. And she runs her entire life by Jyotish astrology and the right time to do this and the wrong time to do that. And you don't do anything on certain days and you do everything on other days and you do certain kinds of things on the days in between. Okay. And so, and, and it's, she's amazingly successful. And so, you know, I can't deny that she's probably winning by doing that, but she's constantly on the phone with her astrologer and she's constantly asking her guides and her, she, on the phone asking her guides and and I'm like you know you could find those guides in here if you just build some circuitry for that so so she was saying um, a, a couple of weeks ago it, you know it was looking like we were about to to create this proposal ready to take it to the publishers and and she's like no no no, you can't do that you cannot do that yet because mercury is in retrograde and it'll just no just wait Okay, and, and she gave me the date of when it could be, and I was like, ah, oh, whatever, that seems far away, I don't know. I'm just going to stick with this and do this. So there were some things that needed to be tweaked and refined within the proposal itself. 
I mentioned to my agent that my friends, you know, how, how's, how's that sound, right? Well, my friend says that I shouldn't do this because of Mercury being in retrograde. So if you don't mind, I'd really like to wait a few weeks, all right? So I didn't know how to write that, but I was like, I'm going to write this to my agent, right? And, and she writes back to me, fine, we can wait, whatever, it doesn't matter. I don't really subscribe to those things, but if that's what you need to do, that's fine. And I'm like, what am I thinking? It's fine, let's just keep rolling with this thing because it's come to this point based upon something natural that I was feeling. So we're gonna just go ahead and stay in motion. So we went ahead and stayed in motion. She had some things in the proposal that she invited me to refine a little bit or to put in a different order. So I went back and forth with her doing that. And then some pictures that we wanted to put in to create some diagrams that would give the reader uh, at the publishing house some ideas of what we were trying, points we were trying to get across, etc. We put that all together. It came together um, last night. She t wrote me this morning and said, I'm taking it to the publishers tomorrow. And then she put in parentheses, which happens to be when Mercury goes out of retrograde. <laughs> okay? So it all came together riding my little magic carpet ride that I'm riding in my life in the same way that the Jyotish astrologer was telling my friend to tell me, no, 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 don't do that until this point. Turns out those two paths crossed right on time. So what I'm, what I'm inviting us all to recognize is that there is a rhythm that is trying to roll out in your life and you have to go with that rhythm. There is nothing more profound, there is nothing more informative or informed than that, that set of team of uh, guides that reside inside of you as the natural rising impulse that is in each of us that is governing your life to this point in time. It is governing it and the less we think about it and the more we feel and trust, the more we get to be in touch and in sync with it. Let me give you another uh, picture. I've used this analogy many times. Forgive me if I've used it in the master class uh, every time. I might, I don't know. But it is as if you're a surfer and you're out sitting on your surfboard waiting for the next wave to come. And you're sitting there hanging out. And believe me, it's a beautiful thing to be sitting there on a surfboard and just hanging out and waiting for the next set of waves to come and looking at the horizon and, and turning and looking at the land. So the surfer's sitting there. And all of a sudden, they see a so storm coming up. And so they get on the board and they start paddling into shore because they want to paddle and paddle and paddle and paddle and paddle to get to shore to outrun the storm. And they're paddling and paddling and paddling and paddling and paddling and paddling. And what they don't realize is if they would just stop paddling for a minute, there, there is a wave right behind them that so far they're out paddling that if they would just relax, the wave would pick them up and carry them to shore 10 times faster than they could possibly paddle themselves there that there is a wave and there is a rhythm that is running through your life and it brings the right people to you at the right time. It brings the right ideas up in you in the right time. And if you're sitting in the void and there's no idea coming right now, that's exactly perfect. You're sitting between sets. You're waiting for the perfect wave to come to ride in and you're not gonna settle for anything less. And I have said no thank you to so many things that, have, that would have gotten me so much as out there more, more quickly, but it wasn't authentic. It didn't feel right for me. It didn't feel true. And I was told, you're missing it. You're going to miss the opportunity. Don't let, you, don't let yourself miss this. And I just couldn't do it. I would try to go or I would try to push send on, on, the, on, on sending something in. And it just wouldn't happen. Because I happened to, through grace, have been in, tuned in enough to the true guiding principle, the governing principle within the core of my being that it wouldn't let me do something that wasn't serving true integration, true authenticity, and the true expression of why I am here. It was through grace, but I happened to be attuned to that appreciative space enough in gratitude that I caught what it was and I got onto it with my mind so that I can translate that into what we're teaching in the Energy Codes coursework to teach the mind, teach our minds how to tap in to that wave of grace that is moving through our lives. Because once the mind hooks into that, we are guided uh, divinely by it. We're guided um, transcendentally. We're guided from a subtle realm and from a supra realm and that that particular combination is in our favor regardless. So there is a huge planetary impact 
a huge solar system rotational uh, mathematical equation to our lives. And rather than learning all of the math, the I Ching is based in the mathematics of, of your life experience. And rather than learning all of the principles, if we can just learn how to feel when it's time to express and when it's time to sit and wait, when it's time to move and when it's time to cultivate, when it's time to speak and when it's time to listen, then we're in the flow without intellectualizing that process and still experiencing pain and fear, but having all these successes. So some of my friends who were on the phone all the time with their Jodish astrologers, not that there's anything wrong with that, but that are constantly, constantly on the phone doing that, also experience more fear and anxiety in between those phone calls than anyone else I know. So how about both hands? You know, how about we get access to all of that infinite wisdom and we also feel good in the in-between moments. That's what I'm really, really interested in cultivating for us. So there will be expansions, there will be contractions, there will be expansions. There has to be an anchoring after every expansion. We want to do that through the coursework. You know what to do. You have to match it. You might have to up-level your current practice to match the up-leveling of your expansions that are occurring as you go along. Because the higher you get in this spiral, the greater the expansions. So we have to be more embodied and more embodied. It doesn't have to become more and more effortful. It will become more and more present in your life. And as that, what happens is we are creating and expressing our creative energy constantly. The expression of our, cre this is big, the, especially ladies, the expression of your creative energy is what allows you to maintain chemical balance in your body. This is true for everyone, men as well, because there's such a thing as menopause as well as, uh, menopause as well as menopause, okay? And that is that when there are chemical imbalances in the body and we don't have the automatic built-in expressions inherently, genetically, cellularly, uh, as patterns subconsciously built into our culture, uh, when those things have completed that are not causing us to express creatively, automatically, like raising children, okay, like keeping a family knit together and keeping all that happening. There's a tremendous amount in the, in the female role uh, in our modeled uh, culture that she is putting forth a lot of creative energy. And that is an expression of her energy. And because of that ongoing expression of her energy, there is a chemical balance that is maintained. When the children are raised and they're out of the house and it is, uh, there is less of that required, when, when our own body's chemistry shifts because we're no longer in childbearing years, some of the chemicals that are necessary to raise children are not predominant in the system. That's another stress. When you put those together uh, because of the things that are culturally shifting and the things that are chemically shifting inside the body, we have the perfect storm and a recipe for the surgence of creative energy. If we don't, haven't connected the circuitry to express that energy outwardly, what happens is it surges as a flash of energy, which we call the hot flashes, which we call the disorientation, the change in chemistry in the physiology. It's all because we don't have the circuits in place to express our magnificent wholeness. The whole of creation is based on a feminine principle. And if we're not expressing in our femininity, gentlemen, that includes you, the feminine principle in you is patience, it's presence, it's kindness, it's compassion, it's authenticity, it's walking your talk, it's being able to live by a handshake and not having to have piles and piles and piles of contracts to be able to do the things that we want to do in life. It's uh, a level of trust, it's a level of follow through, it's a level of knowing who we are. Uh, women, it is in, it's expressing differently culturally as I've already mentioned, but that feminine principle is that nurturing presence that is true in the sustaining around this cycle every time we come around the cycle. If it's not present and we're driving it because of a, of a certain phase in our life or a certain time in our life and we push straight through that, we come and we're bouncing back and forth between here and here. We're not making the complete loop and our chemistry gets messed with. 
that ends up showing up like prostate cancer in men. It ends up showing up like breast cancer and ovarian cancer in women because those are the tissues that are relevant to the nurturing, sustaining, vibrational frequencies of our whole being. There is no mystery to what happens when the body starts to break down. Conversely, there are cultures on this planet that don't even have a word for menopause mm -hmm. because it doesn't exist. It's a non-issue. And so what is it that our country is doing? What is it that our culture is doing that isn't allowing us to express creatively? It is not allowing things like sitting in the void and that being okay. It is not allowing nurturing presence to be in its right time. It is not allowing that impulse to guide us, but rather to drive it with our minds. Right? So it's not serving us. Can you tell? You bet we can tell. Uh, we're one of the sickest countries in the world, and we have more access to more medical treatment than anyone, which I think is part of the problem. So uh, it's about bringing wholeness, before I go off onto that whole branch of conversation, which I can do, um, it is about living in our wholeness. So uh, let me see. How do we do? I think we got it. I think we got it. So there you have it. All right. Fabulous. <laughs> there is only one thing happening here, and it is you. And it is you trying to unfold in your authenticity. That's that. That's the only thing that is occurring. The more you allow yourself to be you, the more healing happens, not only in your own body, but in your relationships, in your families, in your community, and on this planet. When you tap into the heart space, you tap into the frequency that everyone shares. It is the same. All hearts love, and love is the unifying principle. So let us live in love. Thank you for joining us for the master class. To find out more about this, just come to uh, www.drsuemorter.com, D-R-S-U-E-M-O-R-T-E-R.com. It's a great pleasure to spend this time with you. Thank you for your yes. Namaste. Yay! Yay. <laughs>